back to the Michael Brooks Show. Great. Well, this event we're in is horrible. And it is, in the uh, contrast to that, a great pleasure to welcome back to the show our buddy Matt Chrisman from Chapo Trap House. Matt, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. Um, any reactions out of the gate to this? Uh, the cartoon where they do the neck thing, the <laughs> collar. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, we don't know yet exactly what's happening. There's a million conflicting reports and people just making stuff up. Right. Uh, this is also true. But... I mean, it's not the worst response we could have had, honestly. So, I mean, depending on how now it's on us to react to them, uh, which is always the horrifying part, having us, you know, Trump in there with all those psychos deciding what constitutes a proportionate response, considering that they don't really understand what any of that means. Uh, but, you know, rocket attacks on American bases in Iraq have happened before. Uh, so presumably they were prepared for them. It's, you know, within the war, uh, theater. So I don't know. I don't know that the horrible about this stuff is that you can't really, you can't say anything cause you don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's, I mean, I would, I mean, on a brief tangent, I don't believe for a second that whole story that they put out saying like, oh, we gave him these options and the military actually wanted to pick the pussy options, but he picked the tough one. I mean, please, right? Like it's- Yeah, I, they know right? who they're yeah. dealing with. I think they know point. who they're dealing with yeah. and I think they know what his boundless insecurity and relentlessly stupid mindset is. But I, I, I guess the hope was that they would respond in this way that might even be more effective and devastating. And, you know, like, not that I want this to happen, obviously, but yet in such a way that they could satisfy their need for a response, but it would be indirect enough that it wouldn't catch this idiot's attention and it wouldn't make Barry McCaffrey you know, spends interrupt, you know, Ari Melber talking about like, you know, some, you know, I don't know, some new like Maltese guy that texted, you know, Don Jr. <laughs> to say like, yeah, we need to have a full air war with Iran, which hmm. we just played. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, that's cool. Yes. <laughs> well, the thing about Barry McCaffrey is that he's widely known for always being right about everything. <laughs> Can you talk about some of the things Barry McCaffrey has been right about? Well, he was uh, for the kids out there. He was Bill Clinton's drug czar. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if they even have drug czars anymore. I think they got rid of czars because of all of the Tea Party freaks who, who thought that that meant that. <laughs> Wait, so, is that actually true? The is Soviet that Union why we was don't coming. Have drugs are anymore. Because I mean, the, I don't know. I Maybe they right. do, but they changed the name. But I do know that there was that hilarious moment in early Obama when he pointed czars, and everyone just lost their shit because they're like. Wait a minute, that's a Russian word. <laughs> Which, of course, now, if that were to happen, if Trump were to start reporting czars, it would make the exact opposite people have the exact same reaction. Uh, which is cool <laughs> to know that we're just stuck in an Ouroboros of idiocy that'll never end. Uh, but but he was the drug czar under Clinton, and their policy of was just, stop, don't do it. Right. Stop doing it. We're going to throw you in jail if you do the drugs. Which worked great, and that's why you don't have a drug problem anymore. Right. Right. So he basically he and I believe I mean, I I'm guessing, but I'm I'm 98 percent certain that he was on cable promoting the invasion of. Iraq, oh, yeah. Right. No, big time. Yeah. Yes. I think he was involved yeah. in the Panama invasion. I think that was his. That was where he like got his, his actual, that's where he got his yeah, start. That's where he got his spurs. Was 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 that amazing feat of military prowess? You have to say what a pathetic generate like at least like. Petraeus and McChrystal and these other guys can say like, hey, like I, I cut my teeth committing like actual, you know, war crimes in actual situations. And yeah. then like the 80s generation were just like, well, you know, I, I clean shit up for those medical students yeah. in Grenada. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I invaded Club Med. Yeah. And, we, and now I'd like to sit on the board of Raytheon. Yep. It's pretty, yeah, you, you can't even reflect back on your glorious time and service, which is why they yearn for oblivion. Is that really, I mean, honestly, I don't, 
I, and I, I feel doubly awkward saying this because one, I'm afraid I'm being ridiculous and pretentious, and two, it sounds disturbingly close to the uh, Ileana Glazer stand-up bit. But is this like, is there some type of death instinct with these people? Well, there's a death I mean, instinct yeah. with everyone. I mean, the, the okay, death so drive is, right. a, is a feature of psychology. I, I mean, like it, uh, and uh, you know, like politics is uh, uh, politics has to deal with the death drive. Like fascism is basically just weaponizing the death drive and focusing all politics around the death drive. Uh, Talk so, about that more. Well, uh, I mean, it's a the others like William Reich have talked about this about how about how fascism is it, it, fascism yearns for oblivion, which is why every fascist regime has been destroyed eventually right. because it cannot stop. It cannot find stable borders and peace with its neighbors because that undermines its whole uh, psychological raison d'etre. You have to continue pressing and pushing until you've annihilated your enemy, which of course is impossible. So really you're just going to end up annihilating yourself, which is uh, where fascism always ends up. Uh, what we've had since the fall of the Nazis and stuff is this sort of managed, where we take the fascist instinct and we sort of manage it in such a way that it uh, helps us, you know, where we need it, but it doesn't uh, drive us over the cliff. But now we're reaching a point where, due to resource scarcity and the global warming, where it really is changed dramatically or everyone will die. And I think this is the first generation of people who are getting to that realization and deciding, okay, well then we'll just all die. Right. Like to, right. to, to do the other, other than that, to, to confront, you know, the, what we've done with our lives, what we've done with the planet, what we've done to other people is too great a horror. It's better to just press the gas and just slam into the brick wall rather than confront those things. And or yeah, the older you'll you are, die. yeah. I mean, that's the Bruno Latour. I just read this uh, back to Down to Earth by Bruno Latour, and he's saying like he's correlating the Trump fantasy of uh, basically, I mean, hitting the gas. That's what he's talking about in in terms of things like global warming and like this fake nationalism. And also, though, like you know, the Silicon Valley guy is buying bunkers in New Zealand. Yeah. I mean, it's actually also like the oligarchs saying, like, let's hit the the gas and like, we're not really part of this anymore. Right. Or maybe you're not part of this anymore. Yeah. Like, like the the, 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 I hate everyone hates the, when you make the Roman references, but how what, else could what you, happened? What else the, could you do though? in the late Roman Empire? What really happened is is that local uh, powers lost all faith in the ability of the central uh, authority to do anything, to effectively govern, to protect the frontiers. And so they they, they stopped sending uh, their people to serve in the military. They stopped sending taxes. They built walls around their estates. And they created these little, that became the model of feudalism after the collapse of the Roman Empire. And, and they created their little micro powers. And like, yeah, the, you can see the process has been going on as like the, the private wealth has been magnified beyond anybody's conception. It has been going towards, a lot of it has been going towards creating these parallel pseudo state networks that allow them to operate outside. Like uh, the, the one that always tricks me is just very emblematic is the helicopters of Sao Paulo, you know, like we're, we're not going to do anything about this herb, this unworkable urban hell we've created but we can buy helicopters and then just literally hop over it and not have to interact with it at any point and but the next phase now in sao paulo is we're going to keep the helicopters but now and i'm not making like this is true like maybe it's also now legal for you to shoot people from your helicopter yeah. that you feel uncomfortable with yeah that uh, is the so the helicopter is the neoliberal phase yeah now we're in the Trump Bolsonaro phase. Yes. Keep the helicopter and also stand your airspace. Yeah. I mean, you could really argue that the entire uh, uh, sphere of acceptable political argument between you know neoliberal uh, uh, left and and the fascists, you know, and uh, neo, you know, uh, and it's just really to the degree to which we are willing to maintain pretenses. Right. The willing which we're willing to go through the effort of maintaining the the facile lies that keep social harmony because 
at a certain point, if you have reached escape velocity and you have that network and you don't really, then it doesn't matter if this whole thing, if there's any cohesion. Well, what difference does it make? I'm, I, I'm, I've already div divor divorced from it. Uh, ben Elton, the guy who created uh, Black Adder and, uh, and uh, um, The Young Ones, he wrote a book in the 80s. I forgot the name of it, but I remember reading it. And it was this is like in 1985, and the premise was all the richest people in the world have gotten together, and they have been told by all the all the scientists that they've hired to tell them that the Earth is done, that we cashed it, and it's just a matter of time. And so they secretly create a uh, a, pro a program to build uh, private spaceships to go to lunar uh, 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 colonies, and now we're in 2020 and the only difference between that book and reality is that they're not hiding it they're not doing it behind anybody's back they're explicitly telling you we're going to the mars we're going to the moon we're 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 going wherever we have to to avoid what's coming that we created right and and again like in the in the latour version he'll say like it, it's in this, in some sense, it feels so gentle compared to what's happening now. But like a preview of it is George H. W. Bush at the uh, Rio summit in the early '90s, saying the American way of life is not on the table. <laughs> it's not on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're having we're having this whole conference yeah. because we're, there's a consensus that we are literally going to make where we live uninhabitable. Yeah. And the one rider I have to put on this is that the main contributor to the problem. Non-negotiable. And so, I mean, I think there is something to the argument and that has to be reckoned with that, you know, I mean, there has, there will have to be, even with a, a real uh, a, a massive investment in, you know, a Green, green New Deal and, and, and changing infrastructure, like lifestyles will have to change and people in, in a democratic system aren't going to want to do that. Right. But honestly, I feel like if you put it in, if, if people understood the stakes uh, they would. The, the question, the problem is, is that for the people in charge, uh, their loss would be greater than anybody's. Exactly. And they, therefore, aren't going to, no one's going to put it on the table in a way that is going to be anything other than this, yeah, this gerrymandered, ridiculous argument about, you know, uh, plastic straws and flying to Hawaii and all this stuff. Right, right. Well, I mean, oh, I might have a better train system is different than I have to divest my Exxon stock. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those those are really different stakes. I mean, do you are you then I mean, not not to this is I have no interest. I, I'll just I didn't read uh, Bastani's book and I enjoy the work of Navarre. I've seen of them a lot. But just as a frame, do you have a concern with that space communism thing in terms of just the notion that there isn't some part on the table that's like, we're not talking about some type of neo hunter gatherer, like other extreme fantasy, but like yeah. there are limits. I mean, yeah. even with the greatest innovation, like a lifestyle where you, I mean, I'm on my soapbox for a second, but it's like Long Island cannot <laughs> continue. Nor should it, honestly. Or, Forget global warming. How dare you, man? I have family <laughs> from there. You don't get the fuck out of here. How dare you? It's a noble place. Produced Eddie Murphy, Howard Stern, uh, uh, at least some members of Public Enemy. Billy Joel. Billy Joel. A lot of really good routines about Italian people <laughs> done by Eddie Murphy. Uh, the whole what Italian guys are like after they see Rocky would not exist. Yes. Without <laughs> Long Island. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like you can't. It's like, look, of course, it has to be synchronized. We're not talking about just folding back into the woodwork, right? But at the same time, like, I don't think we can totally, you know, discount. Like, some of the ideas that the hippies had were were right. Like, actually, yeah, it is a good idea to, if you can, grow some of your own food and yeah. think about sustainability yeah. in an in actual practical communi communitarian way. Well, the thing is, is that we have been, we, like, I think that one thing that would help with that is if more was done to focus the degree to which the stuff that you think of as as the collective decision of the people was not at all it, like the like the these options are you know like growing your own food most people can't do that they just can't do it and it's right. not because they don't want to right I mean they probably maybe they wouldn't want to but it's not like it's not something that could even get into their mind because the 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 conditions don't exist for it and that right. was on purpose. 
Right. And like that is true. Uh, it's true, certainly with transportation. I mean, we talk about the glory of the automobile and all that, but like these, at this point, these are not decisions anyone can make. You right. know, in a lot, a lot, large part of this country, you know, the people waiting, stuck in traffic jams, you can say about them, oh, they don't want, they don't want a, a train. They want their own car. I love like, the train. Are you if you, me? if you really, if you really put it to them, taking two hours of your day in this thing and not being able to do anything else but drive yourself insane while, while moving, you know, slower than if you were walking. I don't think people would accept that out of like a menu of options. Absolutely. But because it's what we have, we get path dependency and then we decide, actually, no, I, I, I do want this. Because who wants, right. to, who wants to admit that their lives, have, their, their choices have been prescribed in America? Because that's the big, that's the, the, the fantasy of all the fantasies is the idea that any of this is stuff that we chose. It's like the Zizek elevator thing, right? The elevator thing you used to use all the time. Yeah. Where it, it, it it's pre-programmed, but you have like the, you can press yeah. the closed door button. It makes no difference. But you feel like you're But you feel like you're contributing that, that to it. That is a huge pet peeve of mine. Like, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> you're not accomplishing anything. When it's I see, already lit up. What are you doing? When I see somebody doing that, I actually put my foot in the door. <laughs> it's like I did change the outcome here. Yeah, I, I am. <laughs> I'm alive. I am alive. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com/slash/tmbs. Thanks, everybody.